Hello church, here we are in Isaiah chapter 41 and 42. And maybe I'll just explain, for those of us who are just reading this for the first time, you might be wondering what verse 1 is talking about when, it, when God is talking to the islands. What on earth? What he means with that, he's talking about the nations that surround Israel. Okay, so that's going to come up more often in scripture and it comes up more than once even in chapter 41. Then in verse 2, when he talks about stirring up one from the east, it's actually a reference to Cyrus, the king of Persia. And we're going to get into that in more cha in chapters that are coming up in the near future. Okay, so stay tuned for that. But what I want us to see, first of all, here about chapter 41 is that kind of generally speaking, in verses 1 to 20, we can see a lot of descriptors about who God is how he is very relevant and current in the lives of his people and interacts with them, strengthens them, helps, helps them, and so on. He is very, he's very much breathing life into their situation and relevant. And then in contrast, verse 21 to 29, the end of the chapter there, now this talks about the false gods, like the idols that people make and stuff like that, where God is I think he's showing some of his frustration here in verse 23 and 24 when he looks to them and says like, just why don't you guys do something? But it's already said to make a, bring a point across. And the point is they can't. They're dead. They don't speak and they're dead, right? And so in verse 24, it says they're even less than nothing. But this is a really big deal to God. He, he is offended when people choose that instead because it says in the end of verse 24 that he who chooses to worship those kind of idols, that is actually detestable in God's eyes. This is not a small thing, but it reminds me of what 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says. In, in verse 2, it says that you know that when you were pagans somehow or other, like when you were before you accepted Jesus, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. The implication is that God is not a mute idol. In other words, God is a God who speaks and God is not just a piece of wood or stone or something. He is a God who is living and breathing and very much alive. And so based on that, we should already pause there and praise the Lord as a God who is a, a God who is alive and a God who speaks. Praise him for that. Spend some time there. Get lost and praise or not. It would be awesome to do that. Then I want to point out something else. As we're thinking about who this God is, notice what it says. I want to highlight verse 10 and verse 13 and 14 of chapter 41. Here it says that God will strengthen his people. And it says in verse 10 also that he will help them. In verse 13 and 14, two more times it says that God helps his people. Now, when you and I think about God strengthening us or helping us, do you ever have the thought in your mind that that shows his weakness? No. That's silly. Why would we ever think about that? God is, God is sovereign, which is clearly comes out in this chapter. God is incredibly sovereign. We would never question his weakness about that. But here's the thing. You and I are supposed to reflect his character. And so when we, as people, strengthen and help others, do you realize that the world sometimes sees that as weakness? The world has a way of talking that communicates. And sometimes I've even heard Christians talking like this. Like if you don't look out for yourself, no one else will. You got to look out for number one. What? That does not reflect God's character. And the, the thought that the world has is that if we are going to help people and strengthen others, it's going to cost so much that we ourselves are going to become weak. And it's actually seen as a weakness. Church, but God is not weak. We should not think that me helping others is a weakness. Otherwise, we are not. So if we are going to practice what Romans 12 says, we are supposed to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. In other words, we're supposed to start thinking like God thinks instead of conforming to the pattern of the world. And it's the world who says, look out for number one or no one else will. Not true. Look at what we're supposed to do. There's a couple of ways the Bible uses different words to describe something similar. In Isaiah 58 verse 10, it uses, it talks about helping the oppressed and it uses these words. It says, spend yourselves on their behalf. In other words, that's going to take a bit of effort at a cost, but it's worth it because it reflects who God is. In 1 John chapter 3, it talks about somebody who has material possessions and sees their brother in need. If they have any love of God in them, should help their brother or sister, right? In Ephesians chapter 4, it even talks about how the, the way that we talk should come out in such a way that strengthens others. And so we could already park there and say, Lord Jesus, I want to reflect your character. Show me who I can strengthen and help today. And here's the flip side to that is, if we're going to do a good job of 
being those who help and strengthen others, we should allow others to help and strengthen us. All right, something to keep in mind. Then when you get into chapter 42, again, lots could be said here, but simply put, verse one to nine is clearly talking about Jesus, where chapter 41 talked a lot about Cyrus. This here in 42 is clearly talking about Jesus. In fact, the first four verses are quoted in Matthew chapter 12, uh, and, and where there, um, Jesus makes that clear and obvious connection. But I want to highlight one thing out of that, okay? There's lots of good things in there, but let me just look at verse 2 and verse 3. It describes Jesus as someone who did not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets, and a bruised reed he will not break. How does a reed get bruised? Something probably bumped against it and hit it, and now it's wounded and almost ready to break, but hasn't quite broken yet. You know how Jesus handles those? He doesn't break them, right? Or a smoldering wick. He doesn't snuff them out. He actually wants to breathe life into those situations. That's that helping and strengthening that we were talking about in verse 41. But I want to also recognize this. Jesus is gentle. Do you realize that? Jesus is gentle and we ought to reflect him in his gentleness as well. Galatians 5 says gentleness is one of the fruit. It's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. And in Philippians 4, it says, let your gentleness be evident to all because the Lord is near. Church, let us, let's not confuse gentleness with weakness. Jesus was never weak and is not weak, and yet he's gentle. He spoke with authority, and yet he was gentle. We might even ask the Lord a question like this today. Jesus, does my level of gentleness reflect yours? And then remember that whether you are a leader, an owner of a business, a parent, or whoever, God is calling you to reflect the character of Jesus. Enjoy your day with him today. 